Chapter Nine of Tor, A Street Boy of Jerusalem by Florence Morse Kingsley. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Patrick Seville. Chapter Nine, Before the Cock Crew. The primal instinct which has ever led man to the kind bosom of earth in his darkest hour led the man Christ Jesus to Gethsemane. And there, under the dense shadow of the ancient olives, he threw himself down upon the ground for that last exceeding bitter struggle with his humanity. And Peter, the Galilean, and the others slept. Tor had followed them, noiseless and unseen as a friendly shadow. He did not approach the king, his master, nor did he again venture to accost Peter. Squatting motionless at the gate of the garden, the child thought confusedly but joyfully of his deliverance from the house of Pilate. It was because I prayed to my father, he told himself, and hugged his lean little body with a low laugh of pleasure. Hereafter I need fear nothing. I will call, and he will deliver me, and neither man nor demon can hinder. His soul went out in a flood of love toward the man who had opened his eyes, and who was at the moment lying upon his face under the olives in a wordless agony, and the child's pure thoughts mingled with the cloudy forms of angels which comforted him. Somewhere afar off lights gleamed among the dark trees. Stealthy footfalls and hushed voices beyond the garden wall reached the boy's keen ears. He sprang up and listened intently. The glare of smoking torches and the irregular tread of hurrying feet sent vibrations of horror through the shuddering night. But the man of Nazareth no longer lay upon his face amid the shadows. He came forth to receive the brimming cup of his sorrows radiant with the power that had never failed him. Stooping over his sleeping disciples, he called them, Arise, let us be going. Behold, he that betrayeth me is at hand. Now Judas had before agreed with the officers that he would greet his master with a kiss. So that ye may know the man from his disciples, stupid dolts, every one, and not worth the taking. As the motley crowd of temple police bearing torches followed by a rabble of the curious, advanced into the gloom of the garden, a superstitious awe fell upon them. They drew back to a man and hesitated, casting fearful glances at the dark masses of trees moving gently in the night wind. Some unseen, noiseless terror seemed to lurk amid the shifting shadows. "'If the man be a prophet,' whispered one, there be blasting lightnings at his call. Let us go back. But Judas turned his sneering face upon the speaker with a low laugh of scorn. Master, master, he cried mockingly, and running forward he clasped and kissed the Savior of the world. Jesus said to him, Judas, betrayest thou the Son of Man with a kiss? Lord, shall we smite? with the sword cried one of the disciples not waiting for an answer peter drew his weapon and aimed a mighty blow at the officer nearest him the man fell back with a bellow of rage and pain while his companion sprang forward and seized jesus the eyes of the prisoner grave calm and compassionate were fixed upon the wounded man from whose severed ear blood spurted in a torrent Permit me thus far, he said gently, to the officers who grasped him by the arms, and reaching forth he touched the ear and healed it. Then that omniscient gaze turned full upon Peter, who stood staring in a frozen stupor at the being he had believed to be the invincible Messiah. Put up again thy sword in its place, said the master. For all they that take the sword shall perish with the sword. Then, answering further the thoughts that looked out of the bewildered, terror-stricken eyes of the man whom he had named the Rock, he said, 
thinkest thou that i cannot now pray to my father and he shall presently give me more than twelve legions of angels but how then shall the scripture be fulfilled that thus it must be but he uttered no prayer to his father and the ranks of the angelic host remained hid from the expectant eyes that searched the empty heavens in that same hour jesus said to the multitude which gathered around him threatening yet awe-stricken by the miracle are ye come out as against a thief with swords and staves when i was daily with you in the temple ye stretched forth no hands against me but this your hour and the power of darkness at that word the darkness closed in about him and it was night in the courtyard of the high priest's home tor lurked in the shelter of a doorway and looked on no one had noticed the child as he slipped in with the crowd that held at its core the silent man of nazareth peter had also followed tor watched the galilean seat himself with the others at a small fire which was kindled in the midst of the place he had turned his back upon the travesty of a legal examination which was going on at the upper end of the hall and was warming his fingers with an air of complete indifference so the dangerous prophet is proven but a man of straw after all quoth one of the lesser officers of the police with a contemptuous gesture toward the meek figure of the nazarene look you upon the fellow now he hath never a word to say for himself and there are no lightnings no thunders by the seven-branched candlestick i declare to you that i was in a cold sweat when i laid hands on the man but i felt nothing more terrible than an arm of flesh and blood under his rabbi's robe a rabbi's robe indeed chuckled another he will wear another sort before many days i promise you but what sayest thou to the healing of ben joseph's ear demanded a woman who had approached the fire i have just talked with the son of joseph he declares that from henceforth he is a believer a great shout of laughter greeted this speech ben joseph hath ever a nimble tongue quoth a black-bearded young fellow who carried a short sword stuck in his belt a nimble tongue say i and the long ears of an ass one of the galileans made a lunge at him but being a clumsy knave of a fisherman and knowing not of the uses of a sword he merely grazed the ear nay fellow the ear was sliced clean off growled peter stung to retort by the sneering words of the judean the woman bent forward to stare at the speaker art not thou also one of the man's disciples she asked curiously i am not said peter shortly he was listening painfully to his master's voice in a low-toned response to the question of the high priest at the sound of a violent flat-handed blow he twisted quite about in his place and beheld the colourless face of jesus slowly reddening under the insult if i have spoken evil he was saying in a low clear voice bear witness of the evil but if well why smitest thou me the galilean arose from his place at the fire breathing deep his strong hands clenched at his sides in futile anger why doth he not blast them with the word of his power he asked himself as he stealthily watched the terrible mockery of justice which was now drawing to its close they were questioning the prisoner sharply now peter could see the dark looks of satisfaction on the faces of the priests and sanhedrists and the sneering laughter of the rabble at their back then came a show of witnesses against the prisoner among the witnesses stood kalu the beggar who had once been blind the man healed me of blindness yes it is so most worshipful lords he whined twas accomplished by black magic and the power of beelzebub i declare to you for he who would lightly destroy the temple of god must needs be of the devil 
"'What sayest thou of the temple, fellow?' demanded the high priest. "'Did the man dare to threaten the temple?' "'Most holy and reverend high priest,' replied Kalu, "'the Nazarene said in my hearing, and in the hearing of this friend of mine, an honest craftsman, as thou seest, I am able to destroy the temple of God, and to build it in three days. The high priest arose in his place, and fixed his eyes upon the prisoner. Answereth thou nothing? he hissed between set teeth. What is the meaning of this saying, which these reputable witnesses bring against thee? Jesus seemed not to have heard the question. His inscrutable eyes were bent upon the ground. Upon his face shone a faint, mysterious light. The high priest bent forward and stared at him unrelentingly. I adjure thee by the living God that thou tellest whether thou be the Christ, the Son of God, he cried in a terrible voice. The man of Nazareth lifted his meek head at the word. I am, he said slowly, distinctly, and ye shall see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of power, and coming with the clouds of heaven. He hath spoken blasphemy, exclaimed the high priest, rending his garments with a gesture of outraged holiness. What further need have we of witnesses? Ye have heard the blasphemy, what think ye? Death, death, he is guilty, came the deep-throated answer of the priests. Cries of triumph, dreadful laughter, the sound of buffeting palms burst forth from judges and witnesses alike. Someone was tying a handkerchief over the face of the prisoner with the mocking words, Behold the prophet! Prophesy unto us, thou Christ! Who is he that smote thee? yelled the savage voice of the beggar who had received his sight, and he smote his blinded saviour with open palms twice, thrice, many times. A suffocating mist rolled blood-red before the eyes of Peter. If he were the Messiah, he groaned, this could not be. The man hath mocked and deceived us from the beginning. Somewhere, not far away, sounded the cheerful crowing of a cock. I will go back to Galilee he muttered, but his leaden feet carried him no further from the awful scene than the porch. Here he loitered, listening with a frightful strained attention to the sounds of ribaldry and laughter that came out to him through the half-open doors. I will go, he said aloud. I must go. It is already day. The servants of the high priest's household were astir and cheerfully busy with their morning tasks. One of them, a buxom maid, bearing a jar upon her head, paused and stared attentively at the Galilean. Aha! she exclaimed. This man also was with Jesus, the Nazarene. Peter raised his heavy eyes to the fresh-colored, inquisitive face of the woman. I know not the man, he snarled with an oath. The woman went her way with a laughing gesture of unbelief. Then others of the bystanders began to cast curious glances at the haggard face and wild eyes of the stranger. They whispered among themselves for a space. Then a man wearing the livery of the house of Anias advanced with an air of determination. Certainly thou art one of them, he said authoritatively for thou art a Galilean. Peter turned upon the man with a torrent of angry oaths. I tell ye, fellow, he cried loudly, that I know not this man of whom thou speakest. The cock crew for the second time. The great doors of the judgment hall were flung wide, and the motley throng of priests and underlings, glutted with their awful triumph, pushed through, dragging the piteous figure of their prisoner. The face of the Nazarene gleamed white and calm amid the dark looks of his persecutors. His loving eyes turned 
for the last time upon Peter, and flashed into his darkened soul the remembrance of that sad word of prophecy. Before the cock crow twice, thou shalt deny me thrice. And Peter went out and wept bitterly. End of chapter 9「Chapter Ten of Tor, a Street Boy of Jerusalem by Florence Morse Kingsley. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Patrick Seville. Chapter Ten in the Palace Garden. The wife of Pilate arose from her couch with a troubled and haggard look on her fair face. The maid who attended the great lady's toilet observed this with curiosity. There is tumult about the gates of the palace this morning, she said, as she combed out the long, blonde tresses with a comb of gold and ivory, preparatory to weaving them into a graceful crown of braided strands. The princess shrugged her fair shoulders with a slight gesture of weariness. There is always tumult, she said languidly. Ah, me, tis a dreary place, this Jerusalem. I would I were once more safely at Rome. If my noble lady will but glance into the mirror, she will behold a fairer sight than even Rome can offer, said the maid obsequiously, and skillfully fastened a fresh brown rose so that its crimson petals rested on the white neck of her mistress. But the tumult of this morning differs from that of other days, honorable princess she went on eagerly. Diomede says that the Jews have seized their prophet and are about to put him to death, if indeed they are allowed. What prophet, girl? demanded the lady, a faint flush stealing into her pale cheeks. Every man is a prophet or a priest, is it not so, in this hateful Jerusalem? And the prophets have loud voices, and they are always creating a tumult. I myself have seen this man, said the girl. He is quite unlike the other rabbis, as they call them, of a gentle voice and stature majestic. I bethought me of my gods in Athens, yet this man a Jew. His name? His name is Jesus. Also, they call him the Nazarene. The princess uttered a faint exclamation. Pardon me, I beseech thee honorable mistress if i have fastened that last plate too tightly hastily interposed the maid withdrawing a jewelled pin from its place and readjusting it with elaborate care didst thou say they were bringing the nazarene here to the palace demanded the princess turning her large dark eyes upon her servant honorable lady the man is already here and my lord, the governor, is attending the case without upon the seat of judgment. The Jews refuse to await the proper hour, and my lord Pilate, with his wonted indulgence, came forth to them. These barbarians have no hearts, noble lady. They are without consideration for the sleep of an illustrious Roman. They should be scourged as slaves. What will they do to him? muttered the wife of Pilate, clenching her white hands. Nay, my lord should have naught to do with this prophet. He must dismiss the case. The maid stared at her mistress in some perplexity. The morning is warm and fair, she said at last. Will it please your highness to breakfast upon the terrace? The lady Felicia is already playing in the garden of the inner court. In the secluded spot, where slaves had spread a table with the breakfast service of the princess, the morning sun struck sparks of splendor from burnished plates in crystal, gem-rimmed goblets, flowers of every delicate color and odor, violets from Gethsemane, lilies from the deep vale of Kidron, roses from the nearer gardens of the palace, heaped a golden bowl in the center, while around it glowed the richer hues of fruit brought from distant parts of the country, and flagons of delicate wine, cooling in beds of snow, fetched 
from the crown of Lebanon for this spoiled daughter of Rome. The lady cast a dissatisfied glance about the garden. Where is Felicia? she asked sharply. She was here but a moment ago, noble lady, replied the maid, who had followed her mistress with a fan of peacock feathers and an armful of embroidered pillows. I will call Ona, but neither Ona nor the child were anywhere to be found, and after a little the princess began her repast with frowning brows. There is too much noise about the palace, she observed in a displeased tone as she tasted a silver fig smothered in wine and spices. The servants glanced at one another with lifted brows. It cannot be helped, honorable mistress, ventured one of them, a young Greek lad, beautiful as a creation of Praxiteles in his short tunic embroidered with blue. All the loud-mouthed Jews of the city, it would seem, headed by their priests are surrounding the judgment seat before the palace the guard would not have admitted them but my lord the governor ordered it he could not do otherwise said the lady with a slight curl of her haughty lip but what is it that they are saying over and again tis a horrid sound like the cry of wolves hungering after their prey again the servants exchanged half-frightened glances, and again the beautiful young Greek answered his lady. "'Tis a custom in this Jerusalem for the governor to release a prisoner at feast-time,' he said in a low voice. "'Perchance the people are demanding this pledge from the illustrious pilot. The lady's face cleared. "'Ah, it is so,' she cried. "'I remember how it befell last year.' My lord will release to them the Nazarene, who was called Jesus. Is it not so, Diomede? The Greek hesitated, and in the moment of silence the child, Felicia, closely followed by her nurse, rushed into the garden. Her golden hair was disordered, and her blue eyes reddened with angry tears. They shall not scourge the boy, she cried, stamping her small foot. I have said it but that stupid, wicked Marcus declares that he will do it. Wilt thou not send for him, mother, and cause him to be punished for disobeying me? The princess turned her eyes severely upon Ona. Where hath the child been, and what is all this about Marcus? What has happened? Ona trembled under the cold looks of her mistress. Tis the beggar boy again, she faltered. He was beating upon the door of the outer court like a mad thing, and demanding speech with your highness. But of course, Marcus— Marcus is a beast, an animal, again interrupted Felicia passionately. Listen to me, princess. I can explain everything far better than the stupid Ona. Dost thou not remember the beggar lad whose eyes were restored by a king named Jesus? I brought him to this very spot two, three days ago. The boy amused me with his story, but Ona thrust him forth because— I remember, said the wife of Pilate, with a strange look. What then? The mob wished to kill his master, the king, and the lad came hither to beg his life. Marcus was about to scourge him and thrust him forth, but I forbade it. I say he shall not harm the boy. Do thou command it also, my mother, and quickly, for Marcus will not obey me. Fetch the lad to me, Diomede, ordered the lady briefly. The young Greek obeyed, and presently returned to the presence of his mistress, followed by the irate porter, his big hand buried in the rough curls of the beggar's head. Tor presented a pitiable appearance his pallid face streaked with tears and dust, his great eyes wide with fear and horror. At the sight of the princess, the child fell sobbing to his knees and lifted his lean arms in an agony of petition. "'My master, my master!' he wailed, and again, "'My master, oh, my master!' The wife of Pilate signed to Marcus to release the boy. Then she ordered Diomede to give him wine. Tor obediently swallowed from the cup 
which was held to his lips, but not once did he remove his beseeching eyes from the beautiful haughty face of the princess. "'Thou canst save him,' he whispered. The lady shook her head. "'I fear that I cannot,' she said. Then, to the astonishment of every one present, she laid her delicate hand on the beggar's rough head. "'Tell me why thou dost love this man, this Nazarene,' she asked softly. "'Nay, do not weep and tremble so, child. I will do all that I can to save him.' Tor choked back his tears, and gazed steadfastly into the exquisite, troubled face which leaned toward him. "'I love him because he loves me,' he faltered. "'He opened my eyes. He is good. He is the king, my master. I love him.' "'Why did the Jews hate him so?' murmured the lady. "'In my dream I saw him, as one altogether lovely, enthroned high above all the gods of Rome and Greece. Then I saw—' She broke off with a shudder. The wild tumult of voices in the square without had risen into an awful instant irritation of one terrible phrase what do they say now she demanded with slowly whitening face turning to diomede who watched the scene with a satirical curl of his handsome lips they are demanding the crucifixion of some criminal your noble highness replied the greek smirking courtier-like but why trouble thyself dear princess over the doings of the wild ramble. The man Jesus is no more than a Jewish peasant, a carpenter, they say. What can such a one be to the fairest princess in? Go, see what is passing without, ordered the lady, with a look which froze the insolent smile on the lips of the Greek. Go, and return quickly. The Greek reappeared almost immediately, with a white, scared face. The scene without beggar's description, noble lady, he began hurriedly, answering the command in the eyes of his mistress. The whole city is at the doors demanding the crucifixion of the Nazarene. The most noble pilot believes him innocent of any crime, and would save him if possible, but hear the mob. It was impossible to hear anything else. Those awful beastly cries penetrated the ears of the very slaves, so that they cowered and trembled. "'My tablets, Mia,' whispered the wife of Pilate. With shaking fingers she wrote a few words upon the wax. "'Take this,' she said, turning to the Greek, "'and give it into the hand of Pilate himself, no other. Go quickly.' The Greek drew back in manifest terror. "'What? Art thou afraid?' sneered the princess hold i will go myself perhaps i can save him so she arose and was descending the steps of the terrace when the child felicia flung herself at her mother's knees with a scream of terror do not go out into that dreadful place mother begged the child they are horrible those jews stay with me the princess paused hesitated and finally yielded the tablets into the outstretched hand of Diomede. Go quickly, she urged. End of chapter 10love triumphant to pilate governor of jerusalem seated upon the ivory chair of office before the palace came the message of his wife he glanced down at it with some impatience when diomede thrust the tablets into his hand with a hurried word of explanation have thou nothing to do with that righteous man he read for i have suffered many things this day in a dream because of him the message was signed and sealed with the signet of the Roman princess. Pilate's pallid and heavy face whitened to the lifeless hues of the wax upon which the fateful words were written. Before him stood the drooping but still majestic figure of the Nazarene, 
robed in the purple robe of his torture and wearing the crown of thorns a piteous sight before which angels were veiling their shamed faces beyond the strong cordon of roman guard surged the wildest cruelest mob of all the ages the governor rose to his feet slowly and advancing to the side of the prisoner exclaimed in his loud passionless voice behold the man mocking laughter furious incoherent shouts coupled with the dreadful insistent crucify him crucify him burst out in wilder clamour pilate looked forth over the sea of terrible upturned eyes and his huge limbs trembled beneath him again he glanced at the pale melancholy face of the prisoner the fellow is not but a jewish peasant he assured himself after all what use to cast roman justice before dogs they will have none of it loudly he called for water in a basin and in sight of them all washed his hands with spectacular solemnity saying i am innocent of the blood of this just person see ye to it back came the mocking inhuman cry his blood be upon us and upon our children pilate ground his teeth with impotent rage and seizing jesus roughly by the shoulder he thrust him forward in the face of the mob shall i crucify your king he shouted derisively we have no king but caesar was the blasphemous answer and with that word was the scroll rolled up and sealed with the seven seals of wrath against the day of wrath and they took jesus and led him away on that same day tor was again a prisoner the wife of pilate in real pity had commanded that the child should be comfortably entertained in the servants quarters until all should be over diomede to whom the carrying out of this commission was entrusted spoke softly to the beggar in the presence of his mistress bidding him to follow out of sight of the lady the greek laughed aloud in his scorn here is a guest for our honourable entertainment he said to the chief butler my lady the princess hath commanded it in which of the chambers of state shall i lodge my lord the official sniffed his disdain is it an animal he demanded it is an animal most sapient collodius laughed diomede a jewish swine eh albeit a small one give him food and wine excellent collodius for he is chiefly bone this animal tor ate for he was starving also he slept fitfully for he was exhausted with fear and weeping the sun shone warm and friendly from the cloudless spring heavens and the child lying upon a rug which one of the slaves had flung down for him drowsily watched the ceaseless dance of young grape leaves in the soft warm wind the tumult without had suddenly ceased and an ominous silence lay heavily upon the city tor thought lovingly of his master in the intervals between dreams he has gone away safely with the men he told himself i shall again find him and he will heal blind folk as before so drowsing and murmuring soft prayers to his invisible father the beggar child rested in the house of pilate while without the walls of the city his master the king was already hanging upon the cross within the great kitchens of the palace cooks were busy preparing the noonday meal dishes and cups clattered cheerfully and the merry voices of maidens burnishing the great wine flagons mingled with the chirp and whir of sparrows flitting back and forth in the blue air suddenly and without warning the bright light of the spring noon began to fail there was no fog no storm but a veil of lurid darkness was blown heavily across the sky doors and windows were thrown wide and terror-stricken faces stared up into the threatening heavens marcus 
the crusty porter of the palace stood fast in his place his dull face blanched and terrified in the failing light tis the vengeance of the gods he muttered the man of nazareth was innocent servants and underlings crowded the passages in terrified groups open to us marcus they cried beating upon the doors till they trembled upon their heavy hinges earthquake wailed a voice from without the gods are shaking this evil city the porter drew the great bolts with tremendous haste and with one accord all rushed into the street scarcely knowing how it had befallen the beggar child found himself on the street with the others running running he knew not whither through empty streets which echoed his light footfalls as in the dead of night somewhere afar off there was the tumult of a great multitude tor stopped to listen then ran on thinking of his master who was waiting for him in the fast-gathering darkness he reached a gate which gate he knew not but it yawned wide and unguarded not far away tor could hear the frightened sobbing of women the strong curses of terrified men the wailing of little children blending with the hurried trampling of myriad feet suddenly athwart the darkness flamed a blood-red silent flash illuminating the heavens from east to west against this lurid background loomed three crosses stark and black all now across the gloomy valleys sounded the sullen crash of rocks the fall of giant trees while the sick earth groaned aloud and trembled beneath its terrible burden tor stood stock still in the midst of the road in that instant of frozen horror he comprehended what had happened oh my father he groaned the foundations of his childish faith reeling with the reeling earth and the omnipotent love answered this feeble cry of the least of his children even as it answered that far-reaching agonized appeal which was sounding forth from calvary and so in a moment or in eternity the heavens cleared and the april sun shone brightly upon the crosses with their piteous burdens upon the terror-stricken multitudes returning to doomed jerusalem upon riven tombs in shattered mountains upon a little child comforted of his father gazing with christ-touched eyes upon the cross of his king they took away the body of jesus before sunset wrapping it in fine white linen and odorous spices and laying it to rest in a garden hard by tor watched all understanding little of the significance of the rock-hewn tomb of the great stone before its door of the roman guard which was shortly stationed before the sealed sepulchre when all was finished the child returned to the city sustained by some strange expectation which he could have explained to no one as he would have entered the gate he came upon a woeful figure standing without and beating upon its breast it was kalu his wicked face disfigured with rage and pain my eyes he groaned the sight of that accursed cross burnt them like a devouring flame and so it was and so will it ever be he who can look upon that cross of agony without tears of love and pity henceforth sees only the blackness of darkness the eyes of his soul are withered tor led the blind man to his old place by the gate and fetched him his cup his staff and his watering gourd now go little dog buy me oil and wine cried the beggar with one of his frightful maledictions and return to me quickly for i am devoured with this flame but tor looking upon him sorrowfully knew that he could no more serve this evil master as in the old days i have done thus far for thee he said in his clear childish voice because of the king my master and because of my father in heaven but i can no longer abide in thy presence farewell and with this he was gone his naked feet making no sound upon the stones of the street many days thereafter did
did Kalu send forth his dolorous cry for alms in the doomed city of Jerusalem, for he lived until the terrible days of the Roman siege, perishing at last of hunger in his chosen place by the Damascus gate. In the green garden close, hard by Calvary, where the Roman guard paced ceasingly back and forth before that silent tomb, Tor lingered, unnoticed and unafraid, as the birds that flitted among the branches of the blossoming trees. It comforted him to be near the resting place of his master, and the lusty life of the young summer sent vague thrills of expectancy through his brown limbs as he lay upon the warm earth, watching the shifting leaf shadows playing upon the sealed door of the sepulchre, and the slow-moving figures of the guard clad in the scarlet and gold of imperial Rome. Toward midnight of the second night, when the great Passover moon rode high in the heavens and the garden slept in its silver light, like the garden of a dream, the child slept too, held in the soft clasp of a vision which had cool figures of delight on his drowsy lids. When he awoke, he lay for a full minute staring into the branches of the olive tree above his head. The grey-green leaves were all alive with a tremulous motion in the fresh morning breeze. A newly awakened bird trilled softly somewhere in the depths of the garden. The aromaic breath of serried lilies swept his cheek like a caress. It was happiness to have slept, to be once more awake. Then he remembered. The Roman guard had disappeared. This much Tor perceived at a single glance. The second searching stare told him much more. The door of the tomb gaped wide. Beside it stood a young man clad in white garments. Tor approached this radiant figure unafraid. Where is the man who opens eyes? he asked quite simply, for the empty tomb appeared nothing strange to the child newly emerged from his healing dreams. He is not here, the young man made answer with grave sweetness. He is risen, as he said. Behold, he goeth before you into Galilee. There shalt thou see him. Tor opened wide eyes of rapture upon the angel. My master is alive? he whispered to himself. I shall see him. He turned as if in a dream, his naked feet making no sound as he brushed light as the dawn past the ranks of lilies. There was a young woman yonder. She was weeping with a smothered sound of long-drawn sobs. Tor laughed softly in his joy. He is alive, he repeated under his breath. Then he saw with wonder that the woman was no longer alone. She was speaking to the risen one, her voice wrenched with sobbing. Sir, if thou hast borne him hence, tell me where thou hast laid him and I will take him away. The child's Christ-touched eyes knew him, though the woman did not. He sank to his knees, his face shining with the dazzling light of the new day. End of chapter 11this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Patrick Seville. Chapter 12 by Genesaret Water. To Peter, broken in spirit, bowed down with the shame of his thrice repeated denials, sleepless with torturing memories of his dead master, came Mary of Magdala at dawn of the first day of the week. They have taken away the Lord out of the tomb she sobbed, and I know not where they have laid him. Peter arose at that word, and girded his garments about him, that he might run swiftly to the spot. He had no thought of what he should do, but a blind anguish of desire to serve the master he had scorned drove him forth like a scourge. He scarce noticed that John, the beloved disciple, was with him, running evenly, at his side. 
then some murmured word of that other disciple brought a faint memory of words spoken and straightway forgotten words of painful prophecy of unearthly hope which he himself had rejected with scorn and impatience the galilean faltered lagged behind and so it came to pass that john was first to reach the open tomb the rosy light of the new day shone softly into the shadowy sepulchre revealing the rough-hewn walls the shallow niche wherein the body had lain the folded cerecloths the scattered spices the place was fragrant bright mysteriously empty peter stared in at the small still empty space those half-awakened memories stirring strangely within him when i have arisen from the dead he murmured half unconsciously had the master indeed uttered those strange words or was his brain touched with some sweet madness he turned to john the eyes of the beloved disciple were fastened upon the empty niche his lips moved as in prayer with sudden hard-won resolution peter entered the tomb stooping to look more closely at the chill empty bed with its array of fair linen and odorous spicery he noticed with an odd tightening of the throat that the fine linen napkin which had been wound about the dead man's head was not lying with the other cerements but was folded carefully apart as if the wearer sitting upon the edge of his couch had placed it there with a tender thought of the giver his bewildered grief-stricken eyes met the look of dawning hope in the eyes of the other he is not here murmured john he is risen and on a sudden his face became radiant with angelic beauty then the two went away in wandering silence to their own house and as they went they met another woman of their company who told them of angels waiting within the tomb with that question which still sounds in ears grief sealed against the truth of omnipresent life why seek ye the living among the dead go tell his disciples and peter he goeth before you into galilee there shall ye see him as he said unto you to galilee therefore after certain days of growing hope and marvellous vision the disciples journeyed in great numbers and with them went a certain small lad of a joyous and shining face no longer a homeless beggar of jerusalem but a brother beloved because he had looked upon the king in the beauty of his resurrection body it was one of the women called salome who first came upon the child as he walked slowly toward jerusalem in the dawning day the little lad was chatting softly to himself the words he had learned on the day of his healing hosanna hosanna in the highest blessed blessed is he that cometh in the name of the king why dost thou sing child asked the woman querulously. she was still bearing the burden of spicery which she had fetched to the empty tomb and her eyes were red with weeping and anxiety i sing answered tor because my master the king is alive he opened my eyes which were blind as night and with these eyes have i seen him alive therefore i sing the woman shook her head sorrowfully for the thing was yet too wonderful for her understanding i have seen the empty tomb she said also i beheld a young man clad in white garments who declared to us that he was alive but i know not what to think how can it be that he is alive when he was dead crucified pierced with a spear and again she wept bitterly i saw him said tor simply the man who opened my eyes he is alive i am going to galilee to see him and once more the child cried hosanna with a clear jubilant voice whose child art thou little one said the woman marvelling at the brightness of his eyes which indeed shone like the eyes of the angel at the empty tomb and where dost thou live i have a father in heaven said tor and once i had a master who was blind 
and a beggar, but him I serve no longer, since I serve only the king who gave me my eyes. And when, by dint of questioning the lad, the woman found that he was without kindred and alone in the world, she took him to her own house. And so it happened that Tor traveled with that great concourse of disciples who went to Galilee to keep the tryst with their risen lord. Again Tor met Peter the Galilean. It was on this wise the child, enchanted with the beauty of the lake, wandered upon the shore at evening, his eyes wistfully following the fishermen as they put out one after another upon the radiant water. I should like to sail away in a boat, murmured Tor to himself. He looked up to find the eyes of Peter fixed upon him. How camest thou hither, small one? asked the fisherman. I came from Jerusalem with the woman who was called Salome, answered Tor. I came to see my master, who was dead and is alive again. Already I have seen him, and I shall again see him. Perhaps, he added timidly, he is there. The child's small finger pointed to the lake, which glowed like a sea of lambent fire in the dying light. Once he came to us walking upon the water, said the fisherman thoughtfully. After a little, his eyes wandered to his boats, drawn high and empty upon the shore. There were others of his old comrades near at hand, and to these Peter presently called out with something of his old energy. I go a-fishing, he said. They answered, We also go with thee. And so the boat was made ready with nets and lanterns and rough fisher's gear for possible wild weather in the night watches. Tor watched the preparations with shining eyes. When all was at length finished, he bowed himself before Peter after his old mendicant's fashion. I pray thee, honorable Galilean, that I also may go fishing, he said timidly. Peter stared down at him in some perplexity. What is it that brings thee over athwart my path, small one? he asked, not unkindly. In Jerusalem thou wast very likely my shadow, and now thou wilt fish. I want to see my master, the king, answered Tor. He is there. Again the small finger pointed to the darkening lake in the solemn blue mountains beyond. It is so beautiful he will be there, he repeated softly. Come then, said Peter, and catching up the little lad, he stowed him snugly in the bow of the great clumsy fishing craft amid a pile of nets. Through stretches of moonlit water, where the breeze rippled keenly, and the dark lee of swelling hills, now anchored, now drifting slowly, under the winking stars, the fishermen bent to their work, and through the long hours Tor lay quite still in the place where he was bid, speaking to no one, but wrapped in a dream of perfect delight, which the men busied with their fruitless fishing could scarce have understood. When now the darkest hour that comes before dawn was already past, and the white mist that shrouded sea and shore and drifted light as thistledown upon the glassy surface of the nearer water began to glow with rose and amber tints of dawn. Tor wriggled his lithe body from its nest of coats and stood upright in the bow. His great bright eyes were fixed upon the wavering curtains of the mist. Listen, he cried suddenly, in his clear, shrill voice. A long, level ray from the rising sun burst through the vanishing clouds, and rested full upon the land not many furlongs distant. Look! cried the child again, and pointed with his finger. Someone, a man, was standing upon the pebbly shore, looking out over the water. The fishermen rubbed their tired eyes and stared. Children, have ye aught to eat? A clear human voice brought the little cheerful question across the narrowing space. No, shouted the fisherman, satisfied that the friendly voice belonged to some wayfarer 
curious as ever to know the luck of an all-night fishing expedition. "'Cast the net on the right side of the boat, and ye shall find,' came the answer. "'Perchance he sees the ripple of a shoal,' muttered Peter, and heaved the great net for another cast. And now the net sank with its weight of struggling fish. Two of the men heaped hastily into the small boat to secure the catch, but Peter and John were gazing past the heaving net at the solitary figure upon the shore. "'It is the Lord,' whispered John, and Peter, with a smothered cry of love and longing, girt his fisher's coat about him and flung himself into the water. Upon the shore burned a fire of coals, and upon it sputtered a great fish, giving forth appetizing odors to the cool morning air. Beside the fire were piled loaves, such as the common people were wont to use with this broiled fish. It was all quite homely and natural, yet the hands that busied themselves with that simple, satisfying meal bore the mark of the nails. The fishermen stood with bowed hands, no one daring to ask the question which trembled on every lip. "'Come and break your fast,' said their mysterious host, smiling upon their awe-stricken silence, and he took the bread and the fish and gave them to eat. So when they had broken their fast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, "'Simon, son of John, thou lovest me more than these?' Peter answered in a half-whisper, "'Yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee.' Jesus said, "'Feed my lambs.' He said to him a second time, Simon, son of John, lovest thou me? Again Peter answered with an anguished glance of entreaty, Yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. Again came the command, Feed my sheep. He said to him a third time, Simon, son of John, lovest thou me? Then Peter burst into a great passion of weeping and wept as on the night he had denied his master. Lord, he cried out, thou knowest all things, thou knowest that I love thee. Jesus said, Feed my sheep. Other words spake he also, which they that heard forgot no more either in time or in eternity. Thus did Peter the Galilean, who was also called Simon, son of John, answer his master three times by Genesaret water, and thus was the bitter memory of his three denials purged from his soul. Verily he loved much, and was therefore forgiven much, and to the end of his days he remembered right well both to cherish the lambs committed to his care by the upper shepherd, and to tend and feed the sheep both in fold and in pasture. So it was that he no more spoke carelessly or slightingly to the little lad Tor, but counting him as a special charge from his risen Lord, he became to him even as a father. And Tor, growing into manhood, learned many things both strange and beautiful from the world's page, but he found nothing there to blot out the memory of the man who had opened his eyes. To the end he followed the king, his master, and Jesus, long since received into the visible heavens over Galilee, yet remained with him a sweet and satisfying presence. End of chapter 12 End of Tor, A Street Boy of Jerusalem by Florence Morris Kingsley